Um, I'm delighted to be here in this lovely place, at least this morning, I guess this afternoon might not be quite so lovely, um, and uh, to be surrounded by a collection of scholars from whom I hope to learn a lot, and I've indeed already learned quite a few things. Uh, <clears throat> so I've been thinking about quantum theory uh, hard for quite a while, um, but only recently did I tip a toe in the bath of quantum gravity. Uh, so that's not an I'm not an expert in that field. I've thought about it in a highly amateurish work way for a long time. Uh, let's put it that way. Perhaps you can professionalize me a little bit. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about is um, Carlo Rovelli's approach to solving the measurement problem, in particular for loop quantum gravity, his preferred approach to quantum gravity. Uh, and the talk is uh, in part expository, what is Carlos U? It's hard to figure it out, so I've given you a number of uh, key quotations, and I'll give you my reading of what he's up to. It's also partly critical, because um, even though I think he's a, a great pioneer in thinking really hard about the conceptual issues raised by measurement in, uh, in all quantum theories, and in particular in loop quantum gravity, um, I can't follow him all the way. Um, <clears throat> And in particular, he's uh, adapted a relational view of quantum states to loop quantum gravity. And, and here, I, I, in a, I, I partly want to follow him. I, I think it, the right attitude to quantum states is relational. I don't think that the quantum state is the state that the system is in. Think that when you're assigning a quantum state, you're making an assignment relative to something, so that distinct assignments may both be correct, but relative to different things. The something I'll talk about as we go along. Carlo has his own view about what the something is. Um, OK, so on, on the left here, you see the structure of the talk. That will disappear. I don't have fancy slides where you can track progress along the bottom. Um, so, so we're going to go through, uh, after an introduction, Carlo's general approach to uh, quantum mechanics, his relational quantum mechanics, dating back to the 1996 paper, where he didn't talk about low quantum gravity at all. Uh, then I'll talk more specifically uh, and very briefly about loop quantum gravity itself. Uh, then we'll get to the measurement problem. And then we'll put together relational quantum mechanics and loop quantum gravity and start talking about relational loop quantum gravity. Then back to the measurement problem in that new context. And finally, I will say a few things at the end which point towards uh, my view as it's developing and departs from Carlo's view in certain, I think, important respects. OK, so here's the introduction. Although, let's see, let's get you a better picture here. OK, uh, I'll go fairly quickly here. Uh, this is common ground. It's widely believed that the quantum theory of gravity will not take space-time to be fundamental, but that our familiar space-time structure will rather emerge from something more fundamental in a suitable limit of the theory. That might not be true, but it's widely believed. Um, now, of course, any putative quantum theory of gravity, or anything else for that matter, must address the quantum measurement problem. And one strategy for doing that, for addressing the quantum measurement problem, involves a relational view of states in quantum theory. But as a general strategy, it can be implemented in different ways. Uh, in particular, uh, there's Rivelli's own relational quantum mechanics, which I'll mostly be talking about today. But there's also cubism, uh, the theory formerly known as quantum Bayesianism. Um, and there's a my pragmatist approach, which I'll give a little plug for there. Uh, my recent book, which has come out in England, they say, although I haven't received a copy yet, and uh, will shortly come out uh, here, I hope. Okay. So these are relational views, but there are important differences between them. Now here I'm just paying homage to, to Carlo. I think nobody has done more to solve the conceptual as well as the technical problems posed by a projected quantum theory of gravity than Carlo Rovelli. And I think that anybody who attempts to implement a relational strategy towards the measurement problem in quantum gravity, as I do, um, has a lot to learn from Rivelli's path-breaking work here in applying his relational interpretation to covariant loop quantum gravity. So again, what follows should be viewed as an attempt to learn what I can from a critical but deeply sympathetic assessment of that work. Um, and I, as, again, to stress, this is a talk intended to provoke discussion rather than to um, 
tell you what I believe and insist that you believe it too. So let's look at relational quantum mechanics. In his 1996 paper, Ravelli expressed the key idea as follows. Quantum mechanics is a theory about the physical description of physical systems relative to other systems. And this is a complete description of the world. That second conjunct is what makes this view exciting, crazy, certainly interesting. Okay. And he makes his view clear that what the physical description is relative to is itself simply some other physical system. It's not relative to the observer, that's to say some conscious agent or some human or some complicated irreversible amplification device. It's relative to any other quantum system. Observers are not physically special systems in any sense. And he has an analogy here. Just as the observer to which velocities must be relativized in Galilean relativity may be any old physical object, like a table lamp, so also the observer to which the state of a physical system must be relativized in quantum mechanics may be any physical system, such as an electron. It doesn't have to be complicated or cognitive or anything like that, according to Carlo. OK, so, so let's talk a bit about what a state is, according to relational quantum mechanics. And remember, we haven't got to loop quantum gravity yet. We're just dealing with relational quantum mechanics in a, a common or garden setting, non-relativistic quantum mechanics. There, the state of a system is represented by a vector or density operator in a Hilbert space, or on Hilbert space. Um, and it's common to attribute a determinate value to a quantity just in case um, application of the Born rule to that state yields probability one that observation of that quantity would reveal that value. Uh, Arthur Fine called this the eigenstate eigenvalue length, um, or sorry, he called the strengthening of this from a conditional to a biconditional, the eigenvalue eigenstate length. And Rivelli in 1996 in his relational quantum mechanics endorses the eigenstate eigenvalue length. Uh, not all physicists do by any means. Um, uh, David Wallace recently uh, claimed that hardly anybody does. But Carlo does explicitly, but with a catch. He endorses it only for states relativized to a fixed observer system. And remember that all states are so relativized in this view. But, and here it gets more interesting, he also proposes to replace the notion of the state of a system by the notion of the information that a system has about another system. So uh, if we have three physical systems, we have the system S, what you can think of as an observer system O, and what you can think of as another observer system P. Remember, these could be electrons, atoms, anything. It doesn't matter. Some physical system. Again, quoting from a 1996 paper, Q has a value relative to O. By that, we mean relative to P. There is a certain correlation in the S and O states, or equivalently, O has information about Q. So that's the sense in which value attributions get made within this relational quantum mechanics. It's not uh, that Q either has a value or doesn't. That makes no sense in this view. It's whether it has a value relative to O, and that's what we mean by has a value relative to O. But there's a key irreducible difference between P's knowledge that O has information about Q and O's knowledge of Q. Those are quite different things in this view. So let's ask this question. In the situation we're talking about, does O have knowledge of the value of Q? Um, well, that's a kind of a queer question in case O is a simple quantum system such as an electron. Does an electron have knowledge of the state of something? Well, it doesn't make much sense because electrons can't have knowledge anyway. They're not sufficiently sophisticated as physical systems to be warranted the status of agents or eigusses or anything like that. They're just electrons. On the other hand, if we move to the other end of the scale, if you deny that a human observer or even a recording apparatus can know the value of Q, then that's going to lead you to a form of skepticism, which I think removes all, or at least almost all, evidential support for quantum mechanics. So something has to have the knowledge of the value of Q, and it can't be just an electron, um, at least not in any ordinary sense, and yet somewhere we have to find knowledge of the value of Q. 
in order that such knowledge can contribute to the kinds of statistics we claim give evidential support to quantum theory. But even if we get that knowledge, um, Ravelli can't consistently allow that such knowledge contributes to a complete description of the state of the world. Um, because, again to quote, the incorrect notion at the source of our unease with quantum theory is the notion of true universal observer independent description of the state of the world. And there again, you see the radicalism coming out. Right? If you really get your mind around quantum theory, according to Carlo, there's no such thing as the objective observer independent state of the world. Okay, so the value of a quantity on S, going back to the same scenario I've been talking about, has to be relativized to O, and knowledge of its value cannot contribute to knowledge of the observer independent state of the world. When we say that a physical quantity takes the value V, we should always explicitly or implicitly qualify the statement as the physical quantity takes the value V with respect to the so-and-so observer. Okay, so now let's move on to talk about systems, interactions, and processes in relational quantum mechanics. And again, we're still restricting this context to the context of ordinary quantum mechanics. Uh, loop quantum gravity is still down the road here. Even relational descriptions are not always available, according to Carlo. A quantum description of the state of a system S exists only if some system O, considered as an observer, is actually describing S, or more precisely, has interacted with S. So we don't even have relativized uh, state descriptions or descriptions of a system in terms of state descriptions in this view, unless uh, there has actually been an interaction with some appropriate observer system. Okay, now in the context of quantum mechanics, we can start thinking about what kinds of things systems might be. Here, I think we can think of systems as particles or compounds of particles, where the distinction between simple and compound is typically made contextually rather than being fixed from the beginning. And we represent the state of a system in its Hilbert space, and we have a Hamiltonian determining the evolution in the Schrodinger picture, uh, at least. And what is it for there to be an interaction? That's going to be a recurrent question for a while here. Well, in this context, we represent an interaction by a non-zero interaction Hamiltonian on the tensor product Hilbert space. And as you're all familiar, that can be arranged, at least in theory, to have a specific form in a von Neumann measurement that affects a correlation between the initial state of system S and the final state of another system O. This is all standard stuff, okay? So we have a pretty good idea what an interaction means in this context. And then we can divide up the history of a system into processes of undisturbed evolution punctuated by episodes of interaction. That's what's going on with this system as represented in ordinary quantum mechanics. Now let's move the context to quantum field theory. We're still not at loop quantum gravity, but we're moving in that direction. Here, what do we mean by interactions? Well, in Lagrangian quantum field theory on a background space-time, the systems are going to be things like quantum fields, the photon or electron or Higgs field. Those are the systems we're talking about here. And once we've got a decomposition into positive and negative frequencies, the state of a field can be represented in a Fox space, and its re-evolution is represented by continuous time of unitary operators on this space. Um, and we can get back our particles and classical fields, at least as emergent structures, um, if we take them to correspond to excited states of the associated Fox space in the appropriate way. That's how we get that stuff back, starting from uh, more fundamental systems, which are the quantum field systems. So now what do we mean by an interaction? Well, usually in this context, what we mean by an interaction between two quantum fields is something that's represented in the total Lagrangian by a non-zero interaction coupling term. Um, but then, of course, even for a single field, uh, a term in the Lagrangian can imply non-linearity of it resulting by the Lagrangian equations. equations. Um, in, in that case, we say, or physicists mostly say, that it indicates a self-interaction interaction of that field, the kind of thing that's going on in the gluon field in QCD. For example. So 
we seem to be able to make sense of the notion of interaction as represented in the Lagrangian for uh, quantum field theory. Um, but then this notion of interaction also includes the subcategory of self-interaction. Um, in either case, there's a term in the Hamiltonian with non-zero value, signals the occurrence of an interaction. And it looks pretty much like quantum mechanics, uh, ordinary quantum mechanics. So you can see I'm building up to the question, what do we mean by interaction in the quantum gravity? We haven't got there yet. But here's an issue. Um, if we're just looking at the quote unquote fundamental level, um, the, the interactions are given to us by like the Lagrangian of the world or something like that. Okay. Um, and then we don't have freedom to engineer episodic von Neumann measurements in this context, at least if we describe them or describe what's going on in the framework of uh, quantum field theory. I talked to Carlo about this. I showed him basically these slides, and he, he got a bit worried at this point. He said, well, look, you can get back von Neumann interactions in some kind of suitable um, limit because you want to think that ordinary quantum mechanics is, after all, just a limiting case of quantum field theory. And yeah, that's true. Um, but in a sense, you're helping yourself to something which is supposed to emerge from loop quantum gravity if you do that. And that's going to be, um, perhaps at this point, uh, an unimportant um, quibble with what I'm saying, but later it's going to be more important uh, in a different context. Okay, so let's talk about loop quantum gravity. And I'll say very little about this because I know very little about this. Okay, in loop quantum gravity, there's no background space time. So unlike the photon or electron field, we can't think of the quantum gravitational field um, as modeled by an assignment of operators to points or regions of space-time. That's not what's going on, it seems to me. And again, I'm here to learn, so tell me if I'm wrong. And also, if we're talking about pure loop quantum gravity, there's nothing else around. There are no fermion or boson fields with which the gravitational field might interact. Um, so if we think about classical GR, the Einstein field equations are nonlinear, so that at least intimates nonlinearity of field equations for a quantized gravitational field. And so one might try to think of this as self-interacting. Um, but this is intimation, it's not implication, it's sort of a hint, maybe, that this is how we can think about interaction in the context of loop quantum gravity. But let's just ask the question bluntly, what could it be for two systems to interact in loop quantum gravity? What could that mean? How do we make sense of that idea? Well, in this recent work, Ravelli and Vidotto say this about Ravelli's relational quantum mechanics. Again, uh, I say loop quantum gravity itself is not mentioned in Ravelli's 1996 paper. Okay, here's what they say, 2015, page 52. A process is what happens between interactions. Okay, that's a start. <coughs> They also insist that the relation interpretation may be used in the context of quantum gravity. But here, a process is not in a space-time region. A process is a space-time region. So that's a big conceptual um, move that's made in the context of loop quantum gravity. What about states and interactions? What do they look like in loop quantum gravity? <coughs> well, we, look, we saw how Ravelli handled the notion of a state in his relational quantum mechanics, and this is supposed to apply to loop quantum gravity, so how does it apply? Again, two quotes from this recent work. States are descriptions of ways a system can affect another system. That's what a state is, conceptually, in loop quantum gravity. A state is not somewhere in space, it is the description of the way two processes interact, or two space-time regions passing information to one another. I read quotes like this, and I think that's, that's a colorful metaphor, but you know, how do we actually cash it out? What, what's really going on here? Um, that's the challenge. Um, so that the systems which are interacting, however they do it, in loop quantum gravity, are space-time regions. But we think of them as processes. A space-time region is a process. A state is what happens at its boundary. That's what we hear. Okay. If you're scratching your head and trying to make sense of this, I'm with you. 
Um, but I think it's a, a useful exercise because there are some deep conceptual matters being discussed here. And if we can cash out the metaphors, we might really get a deep understanding of uh, what's going on in the quantum gravity. And if we can't, well, at least we try. <laughs> okay. So the picture now is, if we get a picture at all, is not a process that's undergone by systems during an interval of time while they've evolved in undisturbed, punctuated by episodes during which they interact with one another. <coughs> that was the picture we had in ordinary quantum mechanics, but that picture's gone now. That's not what's happening in this context. Apart from anything else, the notion of background time has disappeared, along with that of a background space time. So the thought that we could make sense of a history of a system as partly undisturbed evolution, partly interaction. That's gone because history involves time and time is gone. Um, unless we can somehow bring it back in, retrieve it in some limit or whatever, okay. So the picture now in Luke Quantum Gravity is one of systems as processes constituting space-time regions. And their interactions is occurring at the boundaries between these regions, but the boundaries marking the division between processes are not fixed. So we don't have a, a cookie cutter view of what systems are, that we know what they are ahead of time. Um, in fact, we're the ones that cut the cookies when we decide to divide up space time in some way. Uh, and again, you might wonder, what are we talking about dividing up space time? Space time hasn't emerged yet, so. But that's the picture. Um, so the physical theory, to quote the recent work, is therefore a description of how arbitrary partitions of nature affect one another. And this is possible because, as noticed, a remarkable aspect of quantum theory is that the boundary between processes can be moved at will. Final total amplitudes are not affected by displacing the boundary between observed system and observing system. The same is true for spacetime. Boundaries are arbitrarily drawn in spacetime. Okay, finally the measurement problem. What is the measurement problem? Well, everybody has their favorite take on how to state the measurement problem. Um, there's a particularly clear statement by Tim Maudlin, but um, Tony Legge's 2005 statement that I quote here is a lot shorter, and I think gets to the heart of the matter. This is what Legge says. Most interpretations of quantum mechanics at the microscopic level do not allow definite outcome to be realized. Whereas at the level of our human consciousness, it seems a matter of direct experience that such outcomes occur. So what's Ravelli going to do about this? Um, he responds by taking a measurement interaction between S and O to have an outcome relative to O, but not relative to O primed before it interacts with them. And he has this rather nice picture, right? We have, um, here's the system S, this work? Yes, okay. And here's observer O, a very anthropomorphized observer, notice. Um, a wise sage with uh, very precise measuring instruments. Okay. Um, and another sage is measuring this system, and his uh, designation is O primed. Okay. So again, the measurement interaction between S and O has an outcome relative to O. But of course, all outcomes are relative to something. And if O prime is not yet interacted, then there is no outcome relative to O prime. And if you insist on the question, is there really an outcome? You're missing the whole point. Okay. Now the picture depicted O and O prime as human observer systems, despite Ravelli's insistence that observers are not physically special systems in any sense. And I don't think I've like caught him in some kind of contradiction here. He's been perfectly consistent. He's just using a particularly jazzy illustration of the generic situation. While O must be a physically special system to be capable of conscious human experience of the outcome relative to O, Rivelli can consistently claim that there is such an outcome relative to O, whether or not O is physically special in any way. That's perfectly consistent. Of course, there's not yet an outcome relative to O prime because O prime hasn't yet interacted. So what about O prime prior to any interaction with S or O? I think we're all agreed that O prime can't then consciously experience an outcome hasn't done anything um, relevant to um, finding out what the outcome might be, whether or not it has the capacity for conscious human experience. But remember, Rebelli is going to go further by denying that there is any outcome relative to O prime. 
experience to not. For there to be any outcome relative to O prime, O prime must first interact appropriately with S or with O. So before O prime interacts with S or O, there is no outcome relative to O prime. There's only an outcome relative to O. What does this mean? Despite the deliverances of conscious human experience, quantum measurements have no objective observer-independent outcomes in Rivelli's relational quantum mechanics. At this point, you should say, well, of course, if you really thought your way into the framework. So what about relational loop quantum gravity? So here we're trying to bring things together. Well, in his 1996 ex exposition of relational quantum mechanics, he leans heavily on the model of a simple von Neumann interaction um, between quantum systems like S and O that correlate an initial pure eigenstate of uh, observable Q on S with a corresponding final pure eigenstate on O. I think that's my only equation. I'm quite proud of that. Okay. Um, so while observer system O need not be physically special for this interaction to yield a value of the measured quantity on S relative to O, only if O is a special physical system can O be said to have knowledge of Q as a result of this interaction, because only special physical systems are capable of having knowledge of anything. Well, human scientists are special physical systems that may be idealized as quantum systems. Maybe non-conscious measuring apparatus or other kinds of information gathering and utilizing systems could also be said to have such knowledge. But they're pretty complicated things. They're not just electrons. OK, so that's the model in uh, relational quantum mechanics. How can we transpose this into the context of loop quantum gravity? Well, equation one had an arrow in it, which indicated time evolution. Um, we can't replicate that by any temporal evolution at a fundamental level in loop quantum gravity because there is no time at a fundamental level in loop quantum gravity. Instead, remember, what an interaction is is what happens at the boundary between two space-time regions. These regions are now the systems that interact, conceived, remember, as processes rather than enduring objects. Now, observer system O may be reasonably idealized in quantum mechanics as an enduring quantum system composed of a vast number of particles with bulk degrees of freedom corresponding to recording states. That seems OK in the context of ordinary quantum mechanics. But I don't see any analogous idealization in loop quantum gravity. In particular, it seems not to be a reasonable idealization to or an observer system to represent it as a fundamental non-classical space-time region. Um, Again, maybe I'm just not thinking deeply enough here. Maybe that can be done. I, I can't do it at the moment, put it that way. Now, eventually, we're going to have to integrate fermion and boson quantum fields into loop quantum gravity. So you might hope to use these to construct an idealized model of an observer system in LQG. But I believe, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, that remains a distant aspiration in loop quantum gravity. So we don't know how to model an observer system. All right, so finally, what about the measurement problem in relational loop quantum gravity? Well, first point is, uh, again, just insisting what by now should be obvious, there can be no absolute definite outcomes in relational quantum gravity since all states are relative <coughs> to systems. So what the measurement problem becomes is the problem of reconciling merely relative outcomes with the fact that at the level of our con the human consciousness, it seems a matter of direct experience that definite outcomes do occur. They don't occur because all outcomes are uh, relational, and therefore there can be no definite um, non-relational outcomes, despite what we experience. Now, in relational quantum mechanics, I, I'm fairly confident that we could do that by modeling a human observer as a special kind of enduring uh, physical system. But here's a, um, a kind of philosophical point. Right? Even if that works, the strategy comes at a steep cost, I think, because it sacrifices an ideal of scientific objectivity. It's always been a basic scientific norm that a human observer's sincere report states what has objectively happened. Of course, he might be wrong, but the statement is a statement about what has objectively happened. And that norm is violated if O's sincere report of the outcome of his quantum measurement merely reports its outcome relative to him. And for P, the measurement then has no outcome, but only acquires an outcome relative to her. 
after she has directly or indirectly interacted with O or S. Well, you might say, what, what are you philosophers doing coming in insisting on some objective norm for science? Um, maybe it's not inviolable. Maybe science could continue without it, as long as no further observations by O or P or any other observer could make the violation manifest. Maybe uh, we have a violation, but it never becomes manifest, so it doesn't really matter. Okay. And the structure of quantum mechanics provides strong reasons why it must remain hidden. Repeated careful measurements by any observer on the original system or on other observers will yield relative outcomes and apparent conformity to that norm. So we seem to have uh, retained conformity to this norm. Um, that should be enough for you philosophers. But when we take this to loop quantum gravity, um, the model of a human observer there, or the absence of such a model, remains a more serious obstacle to implementing such a relational solution to the measurement problem in loop quantum gravity. A human observer is a very special physical system for which we have no model in loop quantum gravity. And there's no present prospect of modeling even a simple recording apparatus in loop quantum gravity. OK. So now, this is the morals I draw from this story. But you're free to draw completely different morals. And I'd like to hear what uh, conclusions you reach or what questions you'd like to ask me or Carlo if you were here. I think we've learned three things. First of all, relativizing values of magnitudes as well as quantum states to systems, and then only after they have interacted, not only abandons the notion of a true universal observer independent description of the state of the world, but also threatens a basic norm of scientific objectivity. Um, so this is worrying to me. Secondly, while there may be a reasonable idealization of an observer as a physical system in relational quantum mechanics, in relational quantum mechanics, no such reasonable idealization is in prospect in loop quantum gravity. Does that matter? I think that's an interesting question. If we take these morals to heart, then that suggests certain modifications to his relational strategy. Not abandonment, but modifications. Okay? Suppose we relativize quant quantum states, but not values of magnitudes to physical systems. Of course, that's going to mean giving up the eigenvalue eigenstate link, but we should give that up anyway, I think. In that case, it may be possible to retain the basic norm of scientific objectivity and even the notion of a true universal observer independent description of the state of the world. And I at least think that would be nice. Okay. Secondly, it's neither necessary nor possible to treat all physical systems on a par when relativizing quantum states to physical systems. Well, again, I stressed that wrong. When relativizing quantum states, to physical systems. We don't want to relativize magnitudes, taking values to physical systems. Relativization to physically special observer systems will suffice. So Carlo's idea that we can take any old physical system to be an observer system is um, clean, nice physically, um, but we don't have to do it that way. And I suggest we shouldn't do it that way. And here, is, I think, perhaps the most interesting moral. When we're addressing the quantum measurement problem, it's neither necessary nor possible to model the special physical features of an observer system within LQG itself. A physical characterization in terms of structures, such as classical spacetime, that emerge from loop quantum gravity only in an appropriate limit is all that is needed. So my apparent insistence that we model an observer in Loop quantum gravity is something that I think at the end of the day we should drop. Uh, we should feel free to uh, go to some appropriate limit in modeling uh, an observer system and appeal to a physical characterization of a system in that limit rather than at the fundamental loop quantum gravity level. Thank you. So thank you very much, uh, Richard, for for this for this talk. Uh, very stimulating, and uh, my comments are just uh, to be taken as, as an in invitation for for further discussion. I think you uh, rightly highlights that 
central importance of the notion of interaction in, uh, in Rovelli's uh, interpretation. And uh, I'd like to focus on, on, on this. First, there is a, a general issue uh, in, in uh, Rovelli's interpretation of quantum mechanics, independently of quantum uh, um, uh, gravity uh, context. It seems to me that somehow there is two types of interactions uh, at play here, kind of system-system interaction and, and a kind of system-observer interaction, uh, from what I understood. In, in this sense, it's, it's kind of trivial. It seems that uh, somehow the, the, the merging problem then is, 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 not, is not solved, is not, is not solved in, in this sense, since you, you still need this, this divide somehow. That's, that's how I read the, the 96 uh, proposal. And this is, this is also um, an issue which has been raised by uh, Mauro Dorato in, 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 in his uh, discussion of uh, Robley's interpretation of, of quantum mechanics. So I, I'd like to, to know what, what you, you, you think about this. And now, <coughs> and, and it's an interesting because the main motivation of, of Carlos uh, view uh, has always been quantum gravity, but it seems here that there is a tension with, with uh, applying this, his, his interpretation to, to the quantum gravity context, it seems, or at least quantum cosmological context. And then more specifically to the quantum gravity context, uh, you rightly highlight, I think, that, that, that we need a notion of interaction without background uh, space-time, and more precisely without uh, background time, and this might be challenging, especially if we think about interaction as kind of diachronic. Um, process or, or, or this, yeah, um, entity. Um, and his pro Robert's proposal is uh, interaction, as we've seen discussed by, by Richard, as uh, interaction between uh, space-time regions, or more, more, more precisely as what would correspond to space-time regions somehow in the appropriate limits. So because then we could, we could imagine at the quantum, uh, loop quantum gravity level interactions between, between, uh, between entities which would not correspond, or which would be far apart uh, uh, space-time regions, and, and this, this would be a possibility, in, at least in principle, kind of new, new effects that we could detect at the macroscopic level then. Uh, and, and this raised the importance of the notion of boundary, and, and, and in recent work, he has really emphasized this, this, this boundary uh, formulation of, of loop quantum gravity, and, 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 and especially in the covariant uh, formalism. And I, I'd like to, to hear a little bit more what you think about his proposal of understanding this notion of interaction at this fundamental level in terms of a kind of generalized notion of contiguity or adjacency, adjacency or even general notion of, of localization somehow at this, at this fundamental level. Uh, he, Carlo and, and, and Francesca Vidotto seems to, to make this kind of uh, analogy between interaction at this fundamental level and, and this kind of generalized notion of localization. So uh, what, what, what do you think about uh, about this. And finally, ha as you've mentioned, this notion of drawing boundaries is, is arbitrary. So this leads to the, to the heart of the problem, the, the, uh, that there is no objective, absolute, observer independent notion of outcomes or what he calls quantum events. Um, and even the attribution of, of quantum geometrical properties seems to then be uh, uh, <coughs> relativized somehow. And uh, what, you, what you've called to know the, the lack of scientific objectivity then and I'm wondering to what extent it's still a form of realism, or is, is it a kind of weakened form of, of, of a weak form of, of realism? And here I'd like to emphasize the fact that uh, Rowley's appeal to the, uh, to, uh, uh, to the notion of information, notions of information or, or knowledge, I think it's, it's not very helpful here, because uh, we could ask basic questions of uh, who is information, information about what, so taking this, these notions of information, these epistemic notions of information and knowledge as, as somehow fundamental here do not seem to, to help, at least to my understanding. And now about your proposal, I'd like to hear a little bit more about the role of classical space-time here. Uh, is it something like uh, Bohr had, had in mind, for instance, or, or how people interpret the, the, the classical structure that we would need here? And, and more generally, it would be interesting to, to hear a little bit more about your uh, pragmatic proposal in, in the quantum gravity uh, context? That's a lot of questions. Uh, can you go back to the first slide and I'll start Sorry. answering them as best I can. Uh, <coughs> okay. Uh, general issue, two types of interactions. Here <coughs> I'm not quite sure I understand what the issue is because for, for Carla, remember, the observer is just some quantum system. So system, system, system observer uh, uh, in the same category at, at this level. Um, uh, perhaps what you're worried about, uh, and these other guys you were talking about now, uh, we're also worried about, uh, is that um, we think 
ordinarily that the observer is a very special system. Um, the observer is the one that comes away with the knowledge or with the representation of the results of the measurement or whatever. Um, and uh, that kind of observer for, for Carlo is itself just a very complicated kind of system. So at the physical level, there is no distinction between system-system interaction and system-observer interaction, even though the observer is a very special system that is going to be, have the capacity to meaningfully be attributed knowledge. So, so perhaps I didn't quite get the... So he's making a distinction by appealing to the notion of information and knowledge, then? No, I think that's not a, a distinction that, that cuts uh, here, because for his, him, the, the notion of information, as he's made clear in his in recent talk I heard him here, it is Shannon information. It is very um, basic. Okay. It doesn't have semantic content built in. Um, uh, so I think he'd be happy attributing information in that sense to electrons. So okay, so there is there, there is at the fundamental level there is no no observer no 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 fundamental observer notions would be only system system interactions and then it's just an well again I mean th there's trivially uh, an observer at the fundamental level because there's a system at the fundamental level and all, all the observer is is, is a system um, so I, I, I'm sort of with him on this I think this part of the, the machinery works okay but let, let me move on um, sure we could discuss that later or everybody else could as well. Um, interactions without background space-time. Um, yeah, this is a, a difficult notion as I tried to make clear. Um, and if we move on to the thought that interaction is just sort of the same as contiguity or adjacency. Um, that's not true in non-relativistic quantum mechanics. Um, insofar as we can make sense of a notion of contiguity between systems in non-relativistic quantum there could be contiguous systems which are not interacting. Um, it's certainly true in uh, the classical context that we can model contiguous systems that are not interacting. So there seems to be something extra that's involved in an ordinary notion of interaction beyond contiguity. Um, so perhaps I'm just insisting on the usual sense of the word interaction here, which is not a good thing to be doing. Perhaps we can have a kind of muted form of interaction which just comes out as contiguity in the same way that I was suggesting we could have a muted form of information, uh, uh, which I think Carla does want to do. Uh, so can we, can we move on to the second issue? But I think this, this, this equivalence between the notion of contiguity and interaction, it, this is a proposal for, for the quantum level. Yeah, yeah. If, if, to, if to generalize the space and region would be contiguous in this general sense, they would be tracking the vice versa. Right, but remember that in the non-relativistic context, um, there's a distinction between an observer system that has interacted and an observer system that has not interacted. Um, uh, so uh, it's not clear that we still make that distinction if, if we, um, we identify interaction with contiguity. I mean, maybe we can. Um, so I'm open to being um, persuaded that uh, there's a way of making sense of things. But let's go on to the next one. Sure. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I already addressed the notion of information knowledge. Who's information about what? I think Carlo would respond there that he's dealing with a very basic notion of information that has no semantic content, does not require knowledge or the ability to acquire knowledge or anything like that. Um, so who's information? The electron's information. Of information about what? information about that with which is interacting. But, but in, in your talk, at some point, it seems that you're looking for trying to model a kind of more complex yes. Yes. notion of observer. It's, it's very important to do that at the end of the day, um, because at the end of the day, we want to address the measurement problem. And uh, the measurement problem, at least as stated in Leggett's terms, hinges on the immediate deliverance of human consciousness. So that's something that we as humans directly experience and thereby claim to know. So we want to have a very rich notion of information coming at the end. Um, but the thought is that we can build that up from a very impoverished notion of information, according to which electrons can have information too. Um, th that's the project. Uh, really. okay. um, yeah, the last part, uh, of course, that's what I'm mostly interested in myself. Um, I'm trying to get you a little bit interested in it by the way I structured the talk. Uh, so, um, <coughs> What's the role of classical space-time structure emerging in the appropriate limit? And 
could this be collaborated with? Um, well, Bohr has this big deal about um, the unrevisability and um, ineliminability of the classical concepts, um, suitably enriched. No, sorry, it's the other way around. Uh, in terms of ordinary language, suitably enriched by uh, in terms of classical physics. Okay. Um, I think that what I'm suggesting is that to make sense of what's going on, and in particular to address the measurement problem of blue quantum gravity, uh, we have to back up from the fundamental level and help ourselves to emerge in structures in various ways. We have to be able to help ourselves to the space-time that we hope will emerge, and that's going to be a classical space-time, uh, at least in a suitable limit. If things are working well, if not, then maybe we have to go back to the drawing board, right? So we've got something like a, a relativistic space-time emerging, uh, and that's a structure that we can deal with um, on its own terms without appealing to root quantum gravity. Right. Um, so, so, so we have uh, the tools to describe, describe what's going, going on, and in particular, to, to, to mock up a physical observer system at this non-fundamental level. Um, so, so what so in, in, in a sense, in a sense, then, the classical, classical space-time would play a crucial role in, in, in solving the version problem for root quantum gravity then? Um, let me just uh, say yes, yes and see whether I get it. <laughs> okay. At the moment, it seems to me that that's the right answer to give, but I'm, again, um, persuaded, open to being persuaded that that's not the answer I should give. What about pragmatism in the quantum gravity context? Um, well, of course, um, anybody who's actually looked at my book or some of my earlier papers uh, knows that I, I want to be a certain kind of pragmatist about quantum theory in general. Um, and in this context, I think what, what that means is that. What I want to take quantum space to be relative to is not just electrons and not just conscious observers or anything like that, but relative to sufficiently uh, um, complicated and sophisticated physical systems to which it's meaningful to attribute um, cognitive states like knowledge. Uh, um, and uh, if, think, if the quantum state attributions are relativized in that way, um, without simultaneously relativizing value attributions, then I think that we can make sense of quantum theories in general, including the quantum gravity. And we can address the measurement problem in the way I would like to address it in the, case, in the context of ordinary quantum mechanics. But again, this would seem to require classical structures. Classical structures. We have to be careful here. Um, we have to be able to appeal to terminology that is not uh, distinctively quantum terminology. The way I would like to divide things up is not quantum versus classical, but um, quantum versus everything else. Okay. So I want to restrict the descriptive or representational content of that which I call quantum. Talk of quantum states, uh, for example, and most particularly. Uh, that's not going to have representational content. We're not going to be able to describe the world or, or represent it in terms of quantum states. But we have essentially everything else, and that will include uh, concepts of classical physics. It will include new concepts that emerge as we apply uh, quantum theories to new domains. For example, uh, we might want to include um, attributions of color or um, uh, isospin or something. We might want to include that within the non-quantum vocabulary because it will come to attribution of uh, values to magnitudes. Um, so I don't want to be uh, bored in the sense that the, the, the classical language is, is fixed and eternal. <laughs> there can be additions to uh, the non-quantum language, put it that way. Okay. Um, so I think that the general approach to the measurement problem, which is to take state relativization, but not magnitude relativization, um, to be the key can be pursued still in the context of the quantum gravity, as long as that <coughs> which is being relativized to is not itself described at the fundamental level, but as some kind of emergent level. And uh, problem is that we use the beginning, otherwise we won't have the same equation. So Can I get my slides back? Uh, we have three more rows, and I 
Yes. Okay. Okay. Right, right. That's a, that's a very good question. Um, I, I have addressed that in, in a number of places. Um, uh, there's a paper and a rewritten version of the paper appears as a chapter in the book. Um, I take it that um, the acquisition of content to a magnitude claim is dependent primarily on the place of that claim within an inferential structure. You, you know this, but I'm telling everybody else. <laughs> um, such that if many reliable inferences link that claim to other claims, then it has a high content. And if there are few reliable inferences of that kind, it has a low content. Okay. What determines which inferences are reliable? Um, well, uh, we can model that um, within quantum theories of decoherence. Um, and by applying quantum theories of decoherence, we're not describing a physical process of decoherence. We're doing something more, more subtle. Um, we're um, using quantum theory to advise us on the content of the magnitude claims that we are making. Um, and the models of decoherence are typically, although not universally, relatively independent to the state that we attribute. Um, that's one of their strengths. Okay. So there may be different states um, assigned relative to different whatever, different contexts, but it doesn't matter as far as the assessment of content goes because the models of decoherence are themselves insensitive to state assignment. That, that's the move I make. I mean, whether it's successful or not, I mean, I'm open to criticism. If you can find um, cases in which uh, radical differences in state assignment um, somehow uh, lead to different models of decoherence or different results within a given model of decoherence, th then that would be a threat to my view. So it's a contingent empirical observation that Yes, yes. That's the thought. Um, you could put it this way. I mean, you could think of it as a conjecture. I, if this conjecture turns out to be correct, I'm safe. If not, then I'm shot down. So if I understood you correctly, even in normal statistics setting, like uh, this approach doesn't really solve the measurement problem. <laughs> yet, but it depends on what you take the measurement problem to be. He so thinks he solved it. He thinks he solved it. Um, I'm not happy because um, I want to retrieve an objective, um, universal uh, outcome of a measurement. And he doesn't achieve that and says, well, we shouldn't want that in the first place, so there's no problem. Okay, I can understand that, so uh, I'm happy with having no objective. Okay. But even then, I don't see, like, relative to a system, relative to an observer, how that observer gets that outcome. Okay. Because what I understood is that relative to, for example, an observer, mm -hmm. there's a way of actually well, observers, no, no, observers um, are, are set within a wave function. Now, there's the system, there's the observer, and there's a wave function of the joint system. But it's also wave function. Yes, right. And um, that the wave function of the joint. So there's only one wave function. For the for the joint system, um, we have to be careful, right? Um, there is a, a wave function for the joint system relative to some third system. Wave functions, many of them, but the dynamics was unclear. I guess 
Oh, oh, oh. No, 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 no. The dynamics is, is unchanged. It's Schrodinger evolution everywhere. Yeah. Well, actually, I mean, if, if we look at the wave function of, say, observer plus system, uh, and then we have another observer, then that observer will assign a wave function to the joint system. But of course, that observer can also take the reduced state of one of the subsystems. Okay, that's a good question. Um, because as a subsystem, um, uh, a definite outcome is represented to me. Okay. Uh, uh, remember that it, it should be able to read that off from the wave function. No, you can't do that. No, there, there's there's like a, a basic assumption that um, within the wave function, where's the uh, thing to change the slides? Just behind the computer. Okay, <laughs> right, right. If we go way back. Um, Okay, remember here, um, right. There's a key irreducible difference between P's knowledge that O has information about Q and O's knowledge of Q. Uh, for Rebelli, O must be taken to have knowledge of Q. Um, now we from the outside see a correlation and it doesn't pick out a particular element uh, corresponding to a value attribution to Q. But for O on the inside, he just helps himself to the assumption. Yeah, there's an, obviously O can have knowledge of Q in that situation. Which value of Q? Contingent fact. There's no collapse going on that singles out a particular value. It's just that um, quantum theory in this view helps itself to the assumption that there is a unique outcome. And it can do that consistently. That's the point. Okay. So the next question um, yeah, I'm just wondering if this question may reveal my, my realist bias, but it was, it was unclear to me what the ontology is supposed to be in Rebelli's Okay. And there also seem to be many similarities to the Everett interpretation insofar as one relies on entanglement between subsystems mm -hmm. and that is associated with decoherence right. and, and implicitly some sort of branching structure. Mm -hmm. right? And that the observer is just found on one particular right. branch. Um, so I, I'm just wondering, um, I mean, if one at attempts to attribute an ontology to, to this sort of picture, um, it would seem to be essentially a unitarily evolving wave quantum state relative to which one, one identifies the observer on particular branches. Mm -hmm. um, but somehow, but the, the, there seems to be this desire to avoid ascribing reality to, to multiple branches and to, and to really just describe reality to, um, to, to one particular branch relative to one observer. So, so I guess I was just wondering whether you might flesh out in some sense the, if there is an ontology Mm -hmm. what that might be. Okay. Um, well, uh, I think Carla will be very unhappy being sort of sidled into the Everettian camp. Um, uh, what is the ontology? Well, um, the, the ontology is going to have to be relational, uh, at least as far as states go. Okay. Um, what about systems? Um, well, that too. I mean, at least when we get to loop quantum gravity, what are the systems? Arbitrary, chunk, arbitrary chunks of space-time, something like that. Um, is space-time itself in the ontology? Clearly not, uh, because there has to be emergent. Um, what does it emerge from? I don't know. <laughs> I have to ask Carlo that one. Um, if you ask me, I'll give you a radical answer that you won't like. Um, you're asking me rather than Carlo now. I think there is no ontology. Um, I take all of the ontology to be emergent. Emergent from what? Emergent. There's no fundamental underlying ontology which we can describe which is not to deny that there might be, and, and indeed we hope there is some underlying ontology, but our theories don't describe it. Uh, loop quantum gravity will not describe the fundamental ontology. Um, no quantum theory describes the fundamental ontology. That's my radical answer. I don't want to saddle Carlo with that answer. He has to speak for himself. <laughs> um, is that enough? Yeah, yeah, thanks very okay. much. Okay. Thanks, Richard. Um, so this is a question just about the, the three lessons at, at the end. Right. And their sort of relations or otherwise. Yeah. Because it seems like three is something like two applied to the case of the quantum gravity with some of your thoughts about um, you know, where to find space time in that yes. picture. Yes. Um, but is one, we hope, so, so three sort of is a way of applying two 
are those are two or three going to do you do any work in addressing one, or are they really all just being independent? Um, let's see. I mean, I take one to be the key lesson, in fact. Um, so I don't seek support for one from two or three, if that was the way you're thinking. Um, I, I start off with one as a basic working assumption and then need to add to it um, two and three. Uh, that's the way I think of them. Okay. So it's, a, it's not that something like two or three can add a, some kind of notion of objectivity back into the picture. So. Ah, okay. Um, number two, I think, does. Um, Number two is helping us to get the objectivity that one claims, yes. Um, if we can find the right way of relativizing quantum states to physical systems, um, then we can um, make a case that magnitude claims or claims about the values of magnitudes are objective in a way that, uh, or, or are non-relational in a way that uh, quantum state assignments are not right. And it's the, the specialness of the, the, the physically special observer systems that's doing the work for that? Yeah. Right. Thanks. Okay, thank I think we are uh, running out of time. Sorry, we have to wait for Richard's question. So please join me to sign Richard and uh, Vincent.